screen. And I think you should be able to see my presentation right now. Perfect. Okay, so um, yes, thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the possibility uh, to present my research here. Um, as it was mentioned already, um, it's called Uncertainty in Electricity Markets, the German case. So um, just to give you some, some short motivation um, in which context we're talking. Um, so basically the reduction of CO2 emissions is seen as a main goal of the European electricity system uh, in the future. And um, actually to achieve this goal, uh, the expansion of intermittent renewable energy sources is um, actually the key tool to replace conventional generation and to reduce these CO2 emissions. Um, uh, in order to actually actually utilize these renewable energy sources, we also need um, uh, an expansion of transmission infrastructure. And this is um, uh, also an important part actually. So um, as we've seen it actually in, at the moment in, in Europe um, for the zonal market design, which is implemented in Europe, this means um, most of the countries are forming an own uh, price zone with some exceptions, for example, Italy, but um, this is imposing some challenges for the for the zonal market design in Europe. And especially for Germany, um, this will uh, this is the most interesting case basically. And I will uh, tell you later why. Um, the problem um, which is caused there is actually high congestion management needs in the end because, um, because of this renewable energy sources and also in the um, yeah, long run, also inefficient investment decisions. And yeah, Actually, this whole um, this this whole discussion about the challenges of the solar market design imposes some um, some different kinds of uncertainty to the market participants, and that's um, yeah the, the core of my presentation today. Um, basically, what what does uncertainty in electricity market mean? Um, I think this is this is not very very clear at the moment. Um, I try to characterize this into two groups. Um, the first one is parametric uncertainty. So this is on the left-hand side seen here. Um, for, uh, in this category, you, you could think of market input data, for example. So there is some uncertainty about how, for example, electricity demand would, um, uh, yeah, would evolve in the, in, the, in the future. But also there could be uncertainty, for example, about cost parameters. This means, for example, the um, uncertainty about investment costs or the uncertainty about CO2 prices in the future. So there is parametric uncertainty, which could be, um, this, this list could be expanded. I mean, there are multiple uh, possibilities for this. Um, this whole parametric uncertainty is actually um, already very much implemented in models. Uh, this, this can be done rather simple, basically, and um, also literature about this is already given. Um, the more uh, exciting part actually is regulatory uncertainty. And with the regulatory uncertainty, there is uncertainty about, for example, the bidding zone configuration. So this is actually the, the, the building of the price zones in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, for example, you could think of uncertainty about a potential price zone split in the future, or even a switch to nodal pricing. This could also be an interesting um, aspect. And this is uh, this regulatory uncertainty with the bidding zone configuration. It's the kind of uncertainty that the main um, uh, part of my presentation is about. There could also be um, regulatory uncertainty about other things, for example, the regulation of congestion management, for example, the introduction of a market-based uh, redispatch system, which is not taking place in, for example, Germany at the moment. And in this whole part of regulatory uncertainty, there is um, yeah, only few work. And um, basically, this is due to a, a lack of very suitable use cases. But um, Germany is, uh, can be seen as a, as, a usable, uh, a suitable use case. And this is um, uh, why we chose Germany, actually. So um, yeah, let me just give you a very short uh, context about the literature. Um, there is, as I said, a strand of literature already on applications of parametric uncertainty given. So for example, there was some, some research about transmission planning. This can be heavily influenced by parametric uncertainty, but also generation expansion planning is subject to uncertainty. And yeah, but there's only few work actually on this uncertainty about the regulatory settings. So this regulatory uncertainty, for example, this potential price zone split, which um, can, can be applied for Germany, you will see later. And um, one of my co-authors actually started this um, with the first attempt for Germany but in an isolated use case. So they just looked at Germany um, without any um, yeah, international context or something. Um, of course, this, this whole discussion connects very much to the, this discussion of price zone reconfiguration and even the, the discussion about nodal pricing in Europe. And there is um, 
literature about this, which is uh, some years old, but this is now uh, coming up again, this, the, the whole discussion. And yeah, basically there we see that the gap in the literature that we want to fill, but, um, there is uncertainty about the building of prices in an uh, international context. So we look at Germany, but uh, which is basically the, the main part, but um, we look at the international context. So Germany would be connected with its neighboring countries in Europe and trade electricity. And this is what we're what we're trying to do, and this has not been done yet. So why do we choose Germany? Germany is a very special case. Um, there is an expansion path of renewable energy sources in Germany, which is not equally distributed within the country. So as you can see down on the left in, the, in, the, in this uh, graph, this is the installed capacity for wind generation in the year 2016. And you can see this is very much clustered in the, in the northern part of Germany, but not at all in the south. And um, for solar energy, so PV systems, uh, also for the year 2016, this is much more equally distributed, but there is only some yeah, medium potential for solar PV in Germany, basically. So um, there is uh, increasing congestion because of this uh, because of this distribution of renewable energy sources in Germany. On the right hand side here down, you can see both the volume of um, congestion management measures, but also the costs are increasing and are tending to increase in the future. Um, the, the main reason for this is also the slow transmission expansion, which is currently taking place in Germany. Okay, so um, we, we've seen both the duration and the cost of congestion management is increasing in the last years and will also probably increase in the future. So there is this, as I said, that's this, this discussion about a price zone split coming, coming up again between, this is in Germany, especially between the North and the South. And this discussion is active again. As you see, there are also publications which are very recent. And it would basically look like this. So there would be a northern price zone in Germany and the southern price zone. And there is some regulatory uncertainty induced by this discussion. Um, so what do we, what do we, um, why do we want to do this actually? I mean, from two, uh, so, uh, yeah, two zonal prices in Germany, we would expect efficiency gains, both in the short run grid operation, because this um, problem of congestion management would be reduced, but also in the medium term, looking at investment incentives, you would expect a more efficient choice because of the more precise uh, price, pricing signals in Germany. So as I said, this implementation of, of a price zone split is, uh, there is a discussion about it. It's very much uncertain at the moment, but there is the discussion whether to, to do it actually. And uh, several other European countries have done it. So this is not an unrealistic scenario in the end, but even um, yeah, the extent of this price zone split could be, could be discussed. But you see, there is, there is actually this regulatory uncertainty present in Germany at the moment. And this is what we want to, want to analyze here. So we analyze uh, the uncertainty, the incorporation of uncertainty about a potential price zone split in Germany. And this is the, the main source for our uncertainty in this, in this uh, model analysis. Um, yeah, as I said, there is an international spot market, the ahead market for electricity that we're looking at. And this is what the other research does not do. Um, so we look at short-term capacity decisions about generation and also on medium-term investment decisions in generation capacity and we solve them endogenously basically. And um, yeah, exactly, very much in an international context. So we're not looking just on Germany but also on other countries. Um, yeah, but however, the national transmission line investment, this is something we also want to analyze. Um, this is uh, kept on a national basis basically because there is no um, coordination between countries uh, or, or nearly no coordination assumed in this, in this uh, setting that we're using. So we look both on short-term grid operation with uh, the, applica uh, the application of congestion management, in our case, redispatch mainly. Um, and there is a German network planner that we're looking at who decides on medium-term uh, transmission investment, which is always cost comparison to congestion management, of course, and uh, exactly. So we see that this research is actually complementing the existing literature regarding uncertainty about a German price zone split, but we add this international application of this day ahead market. So the question that we want to answer is how does uncertainty about a price zone split in Germany influence in investments in different international contexts? So, so let me come to the solution approach. Um, for uh, solving this problem, we use a fundamental electricity market model. Right, and um, yeah, we're using a multi-level electricity market model to actually analyze these different stages. So we have transmission investment we want to solve, we have generation capacity investment and grid operation. 
Um, and this application of the multi-level electricity market model is um, already present in the literature and that what we're, that's what we're using. So there's this first stage of timing where the German regulator decides on transmission investment. And is, uh, this, this is anticipating the stage two and three, which means the second stage would be the European spot market for electricity with, um, with uh, you know, also the neighboring countries of Germany and they are deciding on optimal generation capacity both on the short and on, to, on the midterm. So there are investments included here. And on the third stage, the last one is, this is grid operation. So we're looking at congestion management, which is necessary. And we are using cost-based redispatch in this, in this setting. And we can reformulate this, this multi-level electricity market model into a two-staged problem. And uh, by this, we, com we can combine the first and the third stage. And this is also um, proven, for example, in the literature sources that I've shown you here, that this is possible and this is the way to solve it. So um, some more words on the concept. So as I said, decisions are in this model based approach taken under uncertainty. So we are applying a stochastic optimization problem. And um, as I said, there are two different ones that we're, that we're solving in the end. So this is either welfare maximization or a cost minimization, which is known to provide equivalent results in the end. So um, the implementation of these problems are, uh, are done in GAMS. Um, and we're having a linear uh, problem for the international spot market. There, the firms can uh, take a continuous choice for capacity decisions. And we also have a mixed integer problem for transmission investment. And there we are forming uh, candidates. So there is only a discrete choice for building up lines, but they can be built up multiple times. So we're having some, uh, some, some room there. And um, yeah, as I said, the market participants, they do form an expectation about the German bidding zone configuration. And they do this according to probability distribution, which means we're looking at different um, levels of probability, basically. So we have two outcomes. Either Germany faces this price zone split that we're talking about with, um, yeah, I, I called this P of K equals two. So there are two price zones, or it remains as a uniform price zone with uh, the probability of K equals one. And we're looking at these different levels of probability here. So first of all, on a very 100% um, yeah, safety, there is no price on split. 100% safety, there is a price on split and something between. So 50-50 and also 75% for a uniform pricing and 25% for, um, for a price on split. Yeah, And that's the, the levels of uncertainty or uh, probabilities that are incorporated in the uncertainty. So. Um, to actually solve this problem, we have, of course, some, some necessary data input. Um, so we use electricity market data for Germany and also for the neighboring countries. So um, the graph you can see on the right-hand side is not, uh, it's just showing Germany, but we're also um, uh, incorporating all the neighboring countries. Um, and also additionally, um, we incorporate Italy. And we use demand scenarios from NSOE for the year 2013, 2014. So they are usually um, provided in this 10 year network de development plan. Um, but the results I will show you um, in a minute, they will just cover 2030 for the moment. So to make it a bit uh, yeah, simpler. And the generation status quo for these countries is based on the year 2025. So you see um, higher demand at lower generation that there might be some, um, some investment into generation capacity. Right, and we formulate this as uh, investment candidates for gas generation. So this combined circle uh, gas turbine base mainly. Also important are the choice of NTCs. So also here we use uh, data for the year 2030 in this um, in this application, but also 2030 would be available. Right. Okay, so on this right hand side you can see this German uh, price zone basically, but you can also see this this dark blue line in the middle. So this would be the potential price on split. And um, if you consider two price zones, you would ask, uh, you would have the, the question about the inner German NTC. So the trade value, which can be traded between the Northern price zone and the Southern price zone. And for this application, we have chosen a value X exogenously, which would be, I think, um, uh, 3000 um, megawatt, I think. But yeah, I, I would have to look this up. And um, yeah, we look, we're using uh, 11 nodes for Germany, like the yellow dots you can see here. And um, these are connected by aggregated lines, basically. And all these lines can be reinforced with a, with a candidate and also multiple times. So um, exactly, this is where we're, we're looking at the line investment, right, in the transmission system. Okay. So let me show you some, some, some results for the last uh, part of this presentation. So first of all, of course, what we're interested in if we're looking at a price zone split, a potential one, um, 
actually how would how would price zones uh, uh, sorry how would the price signals look like so um the graph in the middle actually shows the price differences between the two german potential price zones um if this was if a price zone split would be conducted so um there is actually a positive price difference between the southern and the northern german price zone and this is quite um intuitive basically because you would expect a lower um, price in the northern price zone, especially in times when wind generation is, is dominant. So in the beginning and the end of the year, when solar PV, which is uh, also uh, distributed in, in, in southern Germany, uh, takes uh, more weight, this would uh, actually level, uh, this, this would equalize the prices, right? But there is always, there's never a higher price in the north than in the south. So this is a very interesting result, which is uh, pretty much intuitive from the beginning. And we're looking at the international market, as I said. So um, countries with the connection to the potential southern price zone in Germany could face additional investment incentives in the generation capacity because, um, as I said, prices in the south could be higher than in the north. And so there is a new price signal actually um, coming from that. And this, uh, in the end, also influences line investments in the German grid because, as I said, this market result um, in the end provokes congestion management, which uh, determines the optimal line investment for Germany. So the transmission system investment. So um, yeah, as I said, uh, there might be generation investment uh, incentives for the neighboring countries. And I've chosen um, Switzerland and the Netherlands as, as this, uh, this, this very illustrative example, I think. Why did I choose them? So Switzerland, for example, has um, connections exclusively to the potential southern German price zone. There's no connection to the north. And the Netherlands is just the opposite. So there are exclusive connections to the northern price zone. And in this graph here, you can see um, investment incentives. So this is the, the, the investment which is built up in these two countries, so the Netherlands and, and Switzerland, for the different levels of, um, of this uh, 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 probability for the price on split. So, um, and also this is a very, very uh, a good result actually to show that, um, for example, in Switzerland, these investment incentives would rise with the probability of a price on split, because as I said, the prices in the south of Germany would rise and um, Switzerland could, uh, yeah, face in a potential export uh, uh, in the end, right? And this is actually just the opposite for Netherlands. So these these two results are very much intuitive and uh, prove that probably the, the model is uh, working. And it's in interesting that they um, that they um, depend on the level of uh, probability that we're looking at. So. Um, yeah, this is Switzerland and the Netherlands. Of course, the investment incentives are not always the same for each country. So you could not just say, okay, this was in the south. So you have an investment incentive there because it's always dependent on a composition of multiple factors like demand, renewable energy sources installed and so on in these countries. So um, I've chosen these two because they are very, very nice to, to look at here. And yeah, and interestingly, there is uh, from our data, no endogenous investment incentive in Germany calculated, basically because uh, of these trade possibilities. So we have an interconnected system and this is the reason for that. And finally, um, I would show you some, some uh, results on the line investment in Germany. So this is the graph that I've already shown you um, with our 11 net grid, uh, 11 node uh, grid. And um, as I said, redispatch is assumed uh, to be the congestion management uh, choice and it's assumed to be handled in perfect coordination between the northern and southern uh, price zone so there is no um, lack of coordination there and uh, as i said the uncertainty also changes this optimal uh, grid expansion in the end so for um, these different different levels of, of probabilities that are anticipated for uncertainty um, we would see for a low probability of a price zone split this line seven which is here and um, line 19 and 15, which are down here, these green lines would be built up for multiple times, but for a higher probability, only the line seven and 19, which are in the West here, um, would be re relevant for reinforcement. And also here, um, the interesting fact for this is that trade flows very much affect the line investment in Germany. So this also this international context, of course, matters in this very interconnected system in Europe. Yes, and these are, these are results for the transmission line investment. So, um, I think I'm, I'm still one minute left to conclude my talk, actually. Um, the results that I've shown you very much underline the importance of considering uncertainty in the electricity market. Um, you, were already, uh, you already saw that the mere anticipation of a possible price on split um, could also already lead to alternating investment incentives. Um, so 
uh, if there is a discussion existent, this already changes investments, which is a, a pretty much interesting uh, result, I think. And this is consistent with results from the literature. Um, also national optimal transmission investment, uh, of course, then is influenced by this uncertainty. So this is also uh, a result that we've seen because of this change transmission line investment. However, if you think that uncertainty um, would be already uh, a policy tool to use, actually this, this does not work in the end because expectations and the, the final realization cannot really diverge in the long run. So just the existence of this discussion changes the investment, but it has to be a realistic uh, discussion, I think. And yeah, exactly. This is um, uh, also an important result. And some future work could, for example, consider additionally this um, regulatory uncertainty in combination with, um, with parametric uncertainty, for example, especially when it comes to these uh, future scenarios, for example, for the year 2040 of these end to east scenarios. And also what is planned that I've not shown you yet because it's not, not already done, but um, we could compare the reference results for nodal pricing, which is seen as the lowest cost result um, to compare actually whether these uh, investment incentives that we're looking at are the, the really the efficient measure in the end, because this would be relevant to, to um, categorize it in the end. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, I'm happy to answer some questions if there are. Thank you, Lucas, for your uh, right in time presentation. Uh, we can start. Uh, we have time for uh, some questions. Are there? some questions, interrogations, remarks, comments from the audience? Yes, there is one question, I think, from Brittany mm -hmm. Tarafelli. Hey, uh, yes, yes, yes hi. Please. Um, I thought that was a very interesting presentation. I just wondered if you'd considered the effect that your analysis has on carbon emissions in Germany um, or the surrounding regions. And, and not yet, actually, um, but this would be a very much interesting uh, aspect to look at. I fully agree with you. So um, this could be done by looking at the the um, the final uh, yeah um, market decisions of the of the market participants at the end. So I could analyze actually what um, power plants would produce basically and how the investment would change. This uh, is not yet done, but it could be an interesting fact to look at. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much for this comment, yeah. Can I talk? Yes. Yeah, I have a quick one, Lucas. That was a nice presentation. I just wanted to know uh, if uh, some of your findings, the preliminary ones, and even the concepts as a whole can be carried on to third, uh, third countries, or shouldn't they be worried about uncertainties in the electricity market since most of them do not have access talk of uh, what is really happening after having access. Should the, can it be carried on to third countries or not? Uh, what do you mean by third countries? That is developing countries. Let's ah, take yeah. okay. for instance, Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, it, it, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not very sure about um, how the situation in these countries would look like, but I think um, if you consider always an interconnected system, so if your um, electricity system, especially your transmission lines are connected to other countries, um, this could always be relevant. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I do, not, do not know about these countries in particular, but um, I'm very much sure this could be a relevant aspect also for Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, I think for South America, for example, this this, I think this is the case. I think they are very much interconnected. So I don't know whether there are congestion problems there, but I, I assume they, they could be by the expansion of um, renewable energy sources because the potential is never very much equally distributed among a country, right? So um, okay. yeah, this, this could be relevant for these countries, I think, yeah. All right, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the remark. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Esther. Are there other questions? Yeah, there's another one, yeah. You have the word. Hi, so thank you also for a nice talk. Um, I have one question I would be interested, in which future you, year you looked into for the investment decision? Uh, because I was a little surprised that you don't see any or hardly any investments in Germany. Uh, I mean, regarding the coal phase out and nuclear phase out, I would expect a little differently. 
Yes. Um, we're looking at uh, the, the input data for the year 2030 in this example. So this um, actually influences, as, I, as you said, the investment decisions um, because of the investment cost is changed, right? Um, I agree, this is, this is a, a result that we did not, um, uh, we did not expect basically. Um, however, um, this is certainly something we, we have to look in whether we have a, an error maybe in the data, for example, whether, we, um, uh, whether the, the, the investment costs are not um, uh, calculated right, basically, or the level is, is somewhat not realistic um, because we did um, uh, expect uh, investment in, in, for example, in, in Southern Germany, right? Um, this is something that we have to look in. I, I cannot um, fully uh, tell you why this is the case, but um, we're perfectly aware of this, of, this, uh, of this aspect, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Lucas. Are there any questions, any other questions? Uh, I have one question, Lucas, if you allow me. Yes. If I well understood in the current framework, you are, you are using scenarios for your probabilities. Did you thought to consider a more analytical approach to capture this uncertainty, to try to extract the value of this uncertainty uh, in the optimal decision to invest? There are some famous theories which allows you to do that. Is it possible to do that in your framework or not? Um, thanks for the, for, the, for the question. It's an interesting aspect. Um, basically, the investment decision here is driven by the um, uh, by the, uh, these, these levels of uncertainty, basically. So we have uh, these two scenarios, as you said, um, uh, the, the one scenario would, this price, would be this price on split and the other one would be uh, uh, the, the, the remaining of the, of the price, the uniform price zone. And um, this is actually the only driver in, our, in, in this stochastic optimization uh, concept, I would say, um, to implement a, a more sophisticated way to, to get uncertainty included, I would uh, have to dig Deeper into this, I'm, I'm not sure whether whether this is um, e can be easily done, but I think it's worth uh, worth a shot. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you very much. If there are no questions, uh, I'm proposing you to to go to the next presentation to to let Esther present us uh, some insights from labor supply. <clears throat> and welfare effects of electricity in Ghana. Does geography matter or not? Let's see. Esther, can you charge our presentation? All right. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. fine. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And thank, thanks everyone for joining this presentation. Um, I'm Esther from, um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alicante in Spain. Uh, so today I'll present on labor supply and welfare effects of electricity in Ghana. Does geography matter? So this will just be the outline of the presentation, a quick intro introduction, and I present the model and the data. I'll discuss the results and then conclude. So um, I start the presentation with this graph on access to electricity across regions. I would like you to focus on the red line, which is the one for Ghana. Uh, as obviously can be seen, uh, we can observe that just being Ghana has chucked some successes in terms of its access to electricity, in, at least in the last three decades. We can see that in 1990, the country was, uh, the access rate was around 20%. And currently I think it's around 80. So. Uh, compared to Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the blue line, I think Ghana has done well so far in terms of electrification. 
But has this been seen in terms of employment outcomes in the country? For instance, if we want to look at employment as a whole, or we want to look at the sector, the sectoral employment, such as in the agri, in the service, or in the industry. We, uh, Ghana is actually an agrarian country. So most people are involved in agriculture. And uh, one of the several electrification programs have gone on in the country and some of the aim were, were to help build the agriculture sector. But as can be observed, it seems there is, there is a, a reduction or a decline in employment in the sector, whereas the service sector is seeing some uh, improvement in terms of employment, uh, in terms of its employment and the industry, which is the manufacturing sector he here, is actually being leapfrogged by the service sector. Wage and salaried workers have not really seen much and employment in general has not changed uh, through my sample size that is coming from 2000 to 2017. So what does this leave us? Uh, I think that it's difficult to imagine economic activities without public infrastructures such as access to electricity, public transport, water, and the rest. But then empirical evidence on effects of public infrastructures on labor force participation and welfare in recent years is still lacking in Ghana. Even so are the methodological challenges that we have in existing uh, works. So what do I do in this paper? I will be using um, household survey from 2005 to 2017. Uh, to investigate effects of electricity on labor outcomes such as employment, that's general employment, and then sectoral shifts in the agri and service sector. I leave the uh, industry out because uh, the three the three combined will give us hundred percent, so we can make references to that group. And then I will look at how wages has equally been affected. Additionally, I will look at I will examine the effect of electricity on household demand for durable goods. This is just uh, something I introduced. And then uh, as an additional contribution, uh, this paper tries to explore the complementarities between electricity, water, and public transport using principal component uh, analysis to redo the, that is point one and two and three, yeah. And then I also try to uh, attempt to address indigeneity and infrastructure using slope of land. Okay. There are several literatures that relate to my paper in terms of the data, in terms of the treatment, and then in terms of the empirical strategy. Okay. So how would the model look like? Let's just um, consider individuals, individual I in com community C at time period T. Then I seek to estimate these uh, two system of equations. So the first one, equation one, is the one with my outcome variable. And then I will make a prediction about access to electricity using the slope of land for endogeneity reasons. So my outcome here, y, will be employment, general employment, and then the shift in employment in the Greek and then in the service sector. Then I also look at the wages and then the assets. And then E here will represent access to electricity. X will be a set of controls and Z will be the slope of land. I will equally control for regional and time dummies. And then the standard errors here that we have are clustered unobserved errors at the individual level. The identification simply is that conditional on individual and household characteristics regional and year fixed effects, the estimates from the IV are consistent if we know the usual, um, the, the usual uh, conven the conventional use of an IV is applied. So uh, point one here assumes that the slope of land does not affect any of my outcome variables except to access to electricity. And then point two here assumes that uh, slope of land is sufficiently correlated with access to electricity. In all the analysis, as I stated before, I will replace the E by the infrastructure in those which I conduct using principal component as an alternative um, treatment. So let's look at the data. 
The data here will be household geocoded survey from Ghana Statistical Services for three waves. So that is 2005, 6, 2013, 12, 13, and 2016, 17. You know, I have 50,000 plus uh, individuals who are of age 15 years plus, which is the workable age in Ghana. And these come from ni about 19,000 households from about 1,004 communities in 200 districts across 10 administrative regions. I will discuss the others as we go. So the instrument here is slope of land that I do take from. Amatuli Ama, and co their their um, they are, uh, construction or their plus they are tools which they use um, from the this one is the GMT D twenty ten and it's a near global ninety meters and uh, this one is different from the usual SRTM in terms of the resolution this one is within 30 x seconds they get a elevation model so what i do is that based on the geocodes in the household survey i try to match the communities to the and then i extract the slope at that particular point i will not show so basically that's that there's not much time for me to explain so to construct the Infrastructure in this one thing that needs to be fulfilled is the correlation between the primary um, variables that I'm using. Here I have water, electricity, and public transport, and we can see that they are sufficiently correlated and uh, statistically significant at one percent level. I will I for this analysis, I will only maintain the first component since uh, the proportion explained there is about 58, about 0 0.58, uh, which this means that there is a loss of about 0 0.32 information. And I, I will skip the explanation to that as well. The KMO measures of something adequacy is around 0 0.64. So for this, as I said, I will maintain just the first um, index. So this is the summary statistics, the main uh, outcome variables and some control variables as well. Okay, so let's look at the preliminary results that I have. So from this one, I show uh, the analysis of the electricity and the infrastructure variable on the four main outcome variables that I, I have shown, that is employment, wage and break, uh, employment and then services employment. So web here is the index. So I try to see if preliminary, the slope of land affects any of my outcome variables and it's up, it can be observed that it does not. And uh, uh, electricity and the web index sufficiently affects my outcome variables, which is reported at 1% level. So this is just using an OLS estimate to see how uh, access to electricity and available uh, infrastructure in a community affect employment wage and then uh, sectoral shift in a great and service sector. So the baseline result that I have here is when I use the instrument of slope of land and we can see from panel B that uh, that is the first stage resource that slope of land sufficiently affect my um, my treatment of interest, which is electricity and the web index. And we can see that uh, uh, basically what this is reporting is that as the slope of land increases, access it reduces individuals' accessibility to electricity, to water, to uh, public transport as well. And one thing that comes up is to check the model adequacy and to check how better one of the models performed than the other because I try to compare the two. And we can see that the model with access to electricity performs better 
looking at the information criteria that I use, that is the AIC and the BIC. So basically from those uh, results, we see that employment in general has not changed as a result of having access to electricity in Ghana and uh, as well as the web index. Wages have seen uh, some increment, but is weak significant. But what is so obvious is employment in the agri sector, which has reduced by about 64 percentage points. And we can see the shift that, uh, as I already mentioned, it's obvious that the service sector is leapfrogging the infrastructure sector because the service sector here is taking uh, employment in the service sector has improved by 41 percentage points. When we go to using the web index, I think in terms of the signs, they are the same except in terms of magnitude, they are smaller here. Okay. One thing that I also look at as which is obvious was to see if access to electricity and those infrastructures have caused any increase in the demand for some durable goods. A television and refrigerator, mobile money, Siri machine has reduced but I think for the others has increased. What has not really seen any significant improvements is shares. Perhaps the people are still trying to understand it. I think conversations about it is ongoing. So maybe in the next time you will know exactly what is going on with that one. And then I try to explore some heterogeneous uh, analysis here in terms of females and males. The literature has had it that uh, females have benefited more from access to electricity, especially in those parts of the world, considering the fact that uh, in time past, women were mostly left to be at home in terms of house chores and all that, but with accessibility, it tend to reduce the time spent in uh, household chores among others. And so uh, with the presence of electricity, women tend to benefit more for especially for uh, Southern Asia, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is really what we see. And this increase, this shift in employment from the agricultural sector to the service sector is so huge. I'm still trying to see uh, what uh, can really account for this. And um, yeah, in terms, of the, in terms of the males, we do not observe any significant uh, difference as a result of access to electricity. One important thing that uh, when you talk about electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa especially, is um, it's not just about accessibility, but it's also usage because having access and not being able to use it does not lead to the, benef the developmental benefits uh, from those uh, infrastructures. And so I try to see how power outages also play on those labor outcomes. Basically in Ghana, we have what is popularly known as Dumso, that is power outages, which is um, power going off and coming back and all that we've experienced, we've had several phases of it. And so I try to see when power goes off about six to 12 hours, how does this play? Uh, yeah, how does this affect employment? And then the shift in employment as well as wages. We see that for between six to 12 hours, there is an improvement in, a, uh, there's an increase in employment for about 14 percentage points. But then in terms of wages, there is a, a decrease of about 0.9. And this is not uh, this is not surprising. What is uh, what one may think is this? We are trying to uh, reference this to the group of zero hours off to six hours off. So we are. I think basically one explanation to this is that it's possible that um, uh, when power goes off, I think employees try to take in more people to make up for the losses. But as the increase goes on, I think productivity itself tries to dwindle and then in, eventually they are unable to employ more people. So as power outages increases with time, employment is not affected, but we see wages at each point in time, wages is affected compared to if power goes off between zero to six hours. And we can see the shift 
in the agricultural sector as well. What could be explaining this? If government is unable to employ as a result of access to electricity, then could it be that uh, uh, is self how has self-employment play in this? If wages are increasing, could it be that hours of work have increased as well? And so I try to also see if the underground economy is absorbing some of these employment, and we see that self-employment itself has not changed over time, but hours have changed. And then the underground economy seems to be doing well uh, in terms of as a resource of access to electricity, water, and public transport in Ghana. So in conclusion, uh, we have just shown you that employment shifts, there's been employment shifts from the agri sector to the other sectors because of access to electricity, water, and public transport. And this sector has shifted is only significant among women in Ghana. There has also been some increase and decrease in terms of the durable goods that one is looking at. Also, I have shown that the quality of power supply measured as hours of electricity available uh, is equally important and not just availability and, and not just accessibility. And uh, possible explanations could be self-employment, the underground economy, and hours of work as well. Is my time done? So there, there were some, some uh, policies that I, I recommended in terms of how government could lose in some of the bureaucracy concerning uh, how to become former, how firms can register and all that. It seems the underground economy is doing well in terms of employment. And so if um, uh, the bureaucracies could be reduced, then maybe they could be registered and then in the end we can be able to trace them and we can be able to tax them and the benefits continues on and on and on. Also, one thing that I noticed in terms of why employment has not been affected is mainly because they have, I think in the last uh, decade, there have been some conditionalities from this developmental bodies uh, in terms of the financial aids that have been coming into Ghana, uh, which puts restriction on employment like embargo and employment, typical of it is the one, the IMF bailout, which was extended, has been in existence for about 10 years. So when these uh, borrowing conditions uh, uh, restrict government from employing the people, I think, if uh, all these other uh, people are not being affected in terms of positively, in terms of this borrowing, then I don't, I don't think we are able to uh, get the benefits from uh, this borrowing. So some of those conditionalities should be a bit loosened so the government can employ as well as uh, the private sector as well. One significant thing is that the agricultural sector has not really benefited from accessibility and so uh, policymakers and government uh, bodies should also look at how this is playing. Other than that, the huge cost of electrification projects will not really, we will not really be benefiting from the, um, from the cost that we incur as a result of those projects. Okay, thank you so much for your time. And uh, in case you are unable to give me your comments, this is my email address. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, I'm Esther. To, yeah. So, thank you, Esther. We finished uh, two or two minutes earlier. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, very timely. Um, okay, sorry. Are there questions from the audience? Tatiana? Yes. Thank you very much. Raise your hand. Your hand. Uh, yes, thank you very much. It's thank very you. interesting presentation. And I want to know, as I understand correctly, electricity is more matter than uh, service sector. Is it? I, I did. I, as what? Uh, come, come again. In your presentation, you look at electricity and uh, West, what? 
Electricity as against an infrastructure index, which I created from electricity, water, and yes. public transport. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, I understand correctly that electricity is more matter than other public services. Yes. For the. Yes. Neighbor. Yes. Oh, it's very interesting. I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I, it, it matters, I think, an earlier presentation by Edward Miguel, uh, where he shows, I, I think, in the, in the opening, uh, one of the opening sessions, he was he showed that in Ghana, I think electricity matters for most of the, at least 48% of the people will opt for that for a token to get access to electricity compared to access to mobile money. Mobile money is a, a money transfer system that is available in Ghana. So I think for Ghana, electricity matters for the most. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I see Lucas also. Yes. Um, in the last part of your presentation, you have um, mentioned the underground economy right yeah. um i would like to know maybe you can answer how you actually measured this and how okay. it is used okay yeah i measured it based on individuals response whether they are in the informal sector or not so if you did say you were in the informal sector then i put you in the underground economy activities yeah okay thank you you're welcome other questions I have one. Okay. Hi, Esther. Oops. I thought that was a very interesting presentation. Um, okay. One question I had for you, and I and I apologize if I don't remember your your fixed okay. effects that you included. It's, it's fine. Um, have you considered distance to urban centers as part of your conditioning variables? I was just wondering if it mattered more if you were located closer to an urban center, if that affected. Yeah, we actually, I don't, it's not really, it's not necessarily to an urban center, but if uh, you are closer to an existing grid, you get to have access to electricity. And there's okay. a program that gives that if you are at least 20 kilometers away from an existing grid, with a community size of at least 500 people, there is an existing program of rural electrification that gets you connected. So that is how they are. But uh, one thing that I wanted to do was distance to uh, substations, but I do not have the information on the substations. Okay. But I think I, uh, maybe I could try to do the distance to urban centers, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else wants to ask Esther? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, who's speaking? <laughs> I cannot see. Um. I have, uh, if there is someone or no, nobody else, uh, Estra, I, I, I have a question. Okay. Um, how do you think that it is possible to extrapolate to extend somehow the result, uh, your model or uh, uh, the method to other developing countries, which would be uh, the common and the specific aspect? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know uh, this could be extended, I think, to countries such as Uganda. I think they have the slope. I think as long as, um, basically for Sub-Saharan Africa, even before we consider the slope of the land itself, generation sources, are, among others, are equally a problem. So, and I think even the cost of production is itself a problem. And uh, so, uh, for this can be extended to most parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. As long as there is not money, then government will always try to prioritize extending those infrastructure uh, services to places that are less costly than others. So I think for, 
for almost all of sub-Saharan Africa, I think this can be extended to, yeah. And perhaps part of sub, uh, Southern Asia as well, yeah. Thank you, Esther. So uh, if there are, aren't questions, please let me give the word to Tatiana. Are you ready, Tatiana? She's going to present uh, a research uh, related to using the pa Panza Ross model for selecting electricity markets regulation tools. Uh, and she's treating the case of Russian or state electricity market. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So let me start. Uh, my name is Tatiana Gas, and I'm from Russia and working at National Research University High School of Economics. Uh, our uh, paper is about using Panzer Rosa model at Russian wholesale electricity market. Uh, I would like to tell you some words about Russian electricity market as a whole and to view some other results of competition estimation. Then we have two hypotheses and as a presentation would be the methodology of hypothesis, the results of hypothesis. And after this, I will conclude. So a few words about Russian wholesale twist market. In Russia, there are two markets, retail and wholesale. And at all of these markets, you can have the electricity volume and electricity energy. Uh, my re our research is about electricity energy at the head market, which is, we think, the most competitive part of the industry in Russia. Uh, also, we have transmission constraints, and um, there are areas, free flow areas, where these constraints are less. And uh, it is interesting that not everywhere at Russia is wholesale electricity market. Uh, Far Eastern and some other regions are not the past of electricity market as a whole. And also the strongest constraints is between first price zone and second price zone, where electricity transmission is very low. The goal of our paper is um, uh, twofold. First of all, uh, we think that understanding the features and competition level of the market is necessary for smart economic policy. And also regulatory practices selection is also important uh, and uh, divided of competition levels. In Russia, the liberalization process is continuous and uh, so there is a, a many possibilities of regulatory practices. So our hypothesis first is that the level of competition in different free flow areas is not equal, not only at the market as a whole, but even in the one price zones. And the second hypothesis is that regulation instruments affect prices in different way at reflow areas with different competition levels. And if it's so, it means that we need to analyze competition levels before we make some regulatory practices and use regulatory tools at the market. So what about competition estimators? Uh, here you can see the competition estimators of Federal and the Monopoly Service of Russia and the association of market regulation. So we can see that at first price zone, the, the competition level is higher than at second price zone. And in our results, uh, we have the same results in 
first prize zone, the more free flow areas has limited competition level. And uh, what is our methodology? Our methodology for competition level estimation is Panzer Rosa models. Nowadays, it applies at different sectors, but the better half of researchers analyzes banking and insurance sector because of data uses. Um, also, the main results of the model is ASHSTAT, which can make us the which <laughs> our status competition level of the market. Sorry for my English. And um, we can use not only pr prices of resources, but we can use other methods of price decision. For example, Aslan and Baker use SFI methods for cost prediction. And uh, Nikolai and others use prices at regional level of aggregation. We also use information from official statistics services, not for companies information, because of companies at Russian electricity markets operated many free flow areas at the same time, and we can can split information for each free flow areas. Also. We use the information of trading system administration to know which prices run in the each areas. Our model applied official information by 23 flow areas by each month for three years. Our data was aggregates to date level and then the data aggregates to month level. Uh, but free flow areas includes from 1 to 14 regions, so we aggregated the regional data too. We use the model in differences because the regional information is only in this level. And also, it is not so interesting which price at uh, free flow areas, but it is interesting how it differ from time to time and uh, how it differ on price of factors. So this model is correct to do this, to reach this goal. And uh, characteristics of market uh, which we use in the model is price and non-price parts of supply, price and non-price part of demand, the ratio of demand to non-price of supply and the ratio of supply and demand. We use the different factors and their legs, uh, but the legs wasn't significant. So what is the results? Here you can see the independent variables. First column, it is market structure and also type of generation which is applied at the regions. We use panel data and we use a model with fixed effect. So we divided effects of climate and other regional variables from type of generation. Our stat is the sum of coefficient of coal price, fuel price, and the rest prices. Rest, it is the price level at the region. And we think it is important um, because in other regions of Russia, the price level isn't the same. But uh, our start is from 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. That means that we have moderate competitive and uh, rest prices isn't effect at the type of competitive. It's only effect on the scale of our start. So if we go to free flow areas, we can divide it, it 
at two groups, limited competitive, competitive zones and weak competitive zone. At, uh, the, uh, here you can see descriptive statistics and the number of plants at limited competitive zone is higher than at weak competitive zone. Also at limited competitive zone, the share of gas fired power plants also is higher. If we are speaking about ranges of Ashstad, uh, we can see that Ashstad for free flow areas is uh, from minus one to 0 0.5, which means that competitive levels at these areas is lower that they had marked as a pool. And this is logical, I think. So at the first price zone, we have 10 of 50 free flow areas with limited competition. And at second price zone, only two of five free flow areas are limited competitive zones. So the next step of analysis is to understand and compare the price factors of two types of zone. We make it twice, first time for day head market prices and second time for retail prices. It should be noted that to simplify the formula, the factors represent a block of variables and each variable has its own coefficient. You can see here cross subsidization variables in Russia, we have electricity prices for households, which are regulated and lower than for industry and other users. At 2020, prices for household was 66% of prices for other users, except household. And uh, prices for households was near 80% of prices for industry. Uh, but uh, the prices for industry should be lower because the volume and the transmission costs are lower for industry. So cross subsidization variables reflect structure of sales and day height market because there are regulated sector where prices are lower. And if we have significantly different coefficients, beta and gamma for free flow areas with different competition level, then the price factors for different competition level free flow areas are not the same. And market regulation can influence differently at free flow areas with different competition levels. Additionally, we analyze a similar model for retail markets. And we use the prices of day head markets to analyze how day head markets reflect on retail market. And also I should note that at day head markets, we use the prices of last period of last year and last month. So what is the results for they a high pricing model, we can see that last year prices are significant for limited competitive zones. It is important uh, because the last year prices can catch market condition in a specific month. And the price of last month reflect only the prevalent price level in the market and it is a short run prices. And last year prices is the prices which was last year at the same condition of temperature, of structure of generation and other, other, other factors, which we can catch by the model. Also, it is interest, interesting that index of manufacturing production is 2.25 times higher for weak competitive zones. So 
it is the situation when we have the competitive market and the monopoly and at monopoly demand depend two times higher effect on the price is it when we have the competitive market also the changes in cross subsidization reflects at all market at all types of free flow areas but for limited competitive zones the change in cross subsidization more matter and more influence on price levels oh, but maybe it's the not very interesting results because we can see that at retail market we have not significant effect of price of at day ahead market for weak competitive zones and i think it's an important results uh, but it is on the preliminary results and we are working in this way also which what what at this slide we have some more interesting results it is that demand depends on the limited competitive zone and weak competitive zone but demand at day head market reflect at limited competitive zone and the change in demand, demand index of manufacturing production, index of electricity and gas production reflect at weak competitive zones. And they reflect in different ways. Also, I want to tell you more about non-price part of demand. This is very interesting type of part of demand because it is demand for households and other regulated price levels. And here government have very good regulatory tools because it can divide it non-price demand and take the part of them to the price demand and we have demand response at the price levels. Also, the minus in the formula of demand for limited competitive zones, maybe also the demand response, because when there are lower prices, the more buyers want to buy the electricity. So it can be twofold influence and it is interesting that at this model we have not fixed effects of the region it is pulled model so we can say that at retail market the regions are closer to each other than at day head market and uh, some conclusion we demonstrate applicability of panzer rosa model for Russia full cell electricity markets and divided it into two types of free flow areas. Day ahead market is limited competitive market. It's the first price zone. 66% of areas are limited competition areas. And its second price zone, only 40% of areas has limited competition. Price factors for the different type of free flow areas also different. And the level of competition at full sale electricity market does not affect the competition level at retail market. And price influence factors as different at free flow areas with different competition market, not only at full sale market, but also at retail market too. And cross subsidy components at electricity prices influence at both free flow areas type, but the influence differ. So the same regulation tools may lead to different results at different free flow areas. 
it is uh, references. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Tatiana, for your presentation. So we have enough time for some questions and discussion. Uh, if you have comments or remarks, questions to address to Tatiana, please feel free to do it. I have a question for Tatiana. Thank you, Brittany. Um, okay, so can you remind me what the difference was with limited competition versus weak competition? Okay, uh, limited uh, competition, it is the area where competition is pre present. It is Uh, with competition, it is areas where competition is not at all. It is very close for monopoly market. And limited competition is near for monopolistic market. Okay. And I guess I'm just trying to put this in. Um, I mean, it reminds me of, of US electricity markets where we have some markets that are more competitive than others and some are more like your traditionally regulated utility market. So do you think to some extent that your price effects for the retail market are due to um, due to just rate regulation for customers at the retail level? Uh, yes. At Russia, we have the same regulation at all markets as a whole. Uh, but the effect of this regulation is not the same for different parts of market. And uh, at my research, I tried to, to demonstrate these differences for more smart economic policy. At the model, the government can reflect on parts, price and non-price parts of demand and supply by their tools, for example, uh, hydro power plants or solar power plants. It will be as price part of supply and non-price part of supply. And in different areas, it will be make the different results of regulations, a different influence on prices. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Brittany. Is there other any other question? Uh, if you allow me, I, I have only an interrogation. Uh, Tatiana, I'm not familiar with uh, this kind of uh, models. Uh, I'm, uh, it is possible to explain if uh, this is a first attempt to use uh, Panzaros model uh, in electricity market. Uh, and if yes, or why, uh, you choose, you decided to choose this model among the panel of other types of models. I can't answer for all the world, but at English paper, at the Russian paper, we can see that this methodology is using for electricity markets. But this is a methodology which can split the electricity market at the parts. And a lot of results of Panzer Rosa model is making at splitting markets at the parts. And 
as we know nowadays, this methodology applied for different markets because price information are more open at the different types of market. Because before it was open only for bank sectors because of their regulation. And now the data is more applicable for this model. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think that uh, we can allow uh, Brittany to present uh, uh, her research on toxic hotspots from market design in regional climate policy. Brittany? Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let me just share my screen. Yes, we see your presentation, so all fine. Okay. Okay, so I'm Brittany Tarifelli um, from Louisiana State University Center for Energy Studies, and I'm going to be presenting my research on toxic hotspots from market design and regional climate policy. So in the US, regional climate policies have emerged in the absence of national climate regulation. So for example, I have here a graphic that displays renewable and clean energy standards for different states. As a case in point, California shown here requires that 60% 60, 60 of their electricity be from renewable resources by 2030 and 100% by 2045. But other states, for example, Wyoming or Idaho don't have any renewable portfolio standards or clean energy standards. But even though we have this variation across the US in states requiring electricity from renewable or clean energy sources, they have been very effective at bringing increasing amounts of renewable resources online. And accommodating all of these renewable resources changes the way that the electricity grid is operated. So as an example of that, a change in electricity market design, I have um, the California independent system operator who basically operates the electricity market in California, introduced a Western energy imbalance market in 2014. And what that is, is basically in California, you can think of the electricity market as a centralized, basically operates like an auction electricity market where there's a lot of visibility into potential trades between electricity supply and demand. Whereas in the rest of the West, which is shown here, these different entities, for example, Pacific Core or Idaho Power operate more as traditional vertically integrated utilities that are rate regulated. So what the energy imbalance market does is it basically extends California's more efficient centralized electricity market across the rest of the West. So it's expanding this centralized market across this rate regulated region. And the reason that they're doing this, they're extending this more competitive market across the rest of the West is to help reduce energy imbalances from intermittent renewable resources. But it also potentially changes dispatch patterns. So which generators are online and responding to fluctuations in demand. And that's really important for local pollutants, especially um, NOx and SO2, as where these pollutions, where this pollution is emitted matters because these different um, local pollutants can cause localized damages. So it matters where and when they occur. And this results in localized damages. So it's important to think about as we're seeing changes in electricity market design. So market design is potentially an important local pollution driver, but there's limited research at the intersection of different electricity market designs and local pollution outcomes. So in the literature on local pollution outcomes, it's usually over a, a regulation that was put into place to specifically regulate local pollution outcomes. And this is instead a change in market design that's not intentionally meant to affect local pollution outcomes, but it can affect them. So it's important 
also in the greater context as we're seeing lots of changes in electricity market design across the US and internationally. So for example, the California ISO has extended the energy imbalance market, which is its real-time market or spot market. But they're also considering ex expanding the day ahead market, which is you know the forward day before the, the electricity trading takes place and it's the bulk of the electricity market. So they're thinking about expanding that, which would be a bigger change. Also Southwest Power Pool, which is shown here in yellow, has recently extended a Western energy imbalance services market and they started that in 2014. So this is another balancing market that's, that's um, extending into the Western region. And PJM, which is the market shown here in pink, is currently changing its capacity market design to um, address renewable subsidies. So that can also change dispatch patterns. And then in the broader context, for example, the um, European Union's energy union is integrating electricity markets more closely. So we're, I'm really looking at these changes in market design and how they affect emissions and pollution outcomes, especially local pollution. So the goal of this research is to determine the temporal and spatial effects of introducing a more centralized and competitive electricity market design on local pollutants. So I have two main questions. Does the EIM, the energy imbalance market, lead to more or less local pollution? And when and where are these changes or hotspots occurring? So to set your expectations a little bit for, for this research, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the goals of the EIM. So one thing that EIM was intended for was to enable California to, to meet its renewable and clean energy goals. And so the EIM can help California do that by enabling access to a larger pool of renewable resources. So when we extend that market across the West, California has better visibility into different renewable resources that are operating in other states. So for example, when the sun is shining in Arizona, you could potentially send that solar power in, or when the wind is blowing in Wyoming, you could potentially send that wind power into California. So it can give them access to a greater pool of resources. But the other thing that EIM is intended to do is to help manage variability from these renewable resources. And so to explain how that can change electricity market operations and dispatch, I wanted to use an example from California of their duck curve. So what the duck curve is, is it basically just residual demand. So it's electricity demand, less renewable resource production, and it's plotted by hour of day. So how this graph works is basically the, the lines shown higher up are, um, or older years, and then it's more renewable resources in California, solar power in particular come online, you start to see the belly of the duck emerge. And so what that is, is just, this is when solar power starts. And so this residual demand you see really dips down. And then in the evening when solar power tapers off, you see the neck of the duck emerge. And that's the steep increase in demand that needs to be met by dispatchable resources. So the EIM can help in a couple ways with this. So in the daylight hours when solar power is online and producing a lot, California can send out excess solar power to a larger region. So they can send that ex ex excess power out across the West. And then in the evening when they need this steep increase in demand, they can have access to a bigger pool of flexible resources. So not every generator can turn on and ramp up that quickly to meet this steep increase in demand that's needed. And so the EIM can give California, California access to a greater pool of flexible generators like gas generators, for example, to help meet this steep increase in demand. So that's ways in which the EIM can help to um, California to meet their renewables goals and to better manage them. And the other thing that I wanted to point out, especially for local pollutants, is that the EIM is a really sophisticated algorithm. So it's um, basically a sophisticated computer algorithm that finds the least cost generator that's going to balance the supply and demand of power. Um, and it does this more efficiently than say a vertically integrated monopoly can do on its own. So a thing that can happen is it can help generators to operate more efficiently across this wider footprint. And that affects local pollution because for example, shown here is gas generator, um, gross generation and NOx emissions. 
plotted by hour of day from my sample. And so what this shows is basically this blue line is gross generation. And you can see throughout the day that when gas generators generation dips down, you actually see an increase in NOx emissions. So the solid line is non EIM generators and the dotted line is EIM generators, but they both follow the same pattern that when generation dips down, you see these NOx emissions go up. And so what's happening here is if generators have to cycle more, so they have to turn on, turn up, ramp up, ramp down, you can actually see them emit more NOx pollution. So if the EIM runs these generators more efficiently, you can actually see NOx emissions come down um, if they're not having to, to, to cycle as much. So it's kind of a counterintuitive thing that can happen that I wanted to explain because it also can show in the results. So to preview my findings, on average, I find that participating in the EIM reduces gas generators NOx emissions by six pounds per hour. And that's a reduction of 26% of NOx emissions from the average gas generator. And these peak reductions occur when residual load or demand is high. Um, and annually, that's a reduction of 52,560 pounds of NOx emissions. But I do find that there's significant heterogeneity in the distribution of these local pollution outcomes across both geographic regions and generators. So I'm finding that these more significant NOx emission reductions in gas generators are occurring in more remote regions. And then in coal generators, even though I don't find any significant difference on average in these regional regressions, I find that coal generators in regions close to California are experiencing significant increases in NOx emissions and SO2 emissions. Whereas coal generators in more remote regions further away from California are experiencing significant reductions in these local pollution emissions. And this leads to um, millions of dollars of damages in some of these regions. So to perform this analysis, I use our hourly NOx and SO2 emissions from EPA's SEMS program. And because each of these um, generators are located in a specific balancing authority or region, I have to map them into this particular region that information isn't in the SIMS data. So I use the Department of Homeland Security's um, spatial map to map them into the, their respective regions. Then I have hourly load from FERC Form 714 and also CAISO's OASIS system. I obtain hourly solar and wind production from CAISO's daily renewables watch reports. And then I have a variety of variables that I construct from FERC and SIMS and EIA data. So my identification strategy is to leverage variation in EIM participation across time and space in a difference in differences framework to estimate the average effects of the EIM. And then I use a triple differences framework to estimate the marginal responses to net, net demand. So because the EIM was started by California and it was extended voluntarily to some across the West to different balancing authorities. What happened was some balancing authorities chose to join the EIM. And so the balancing authority and the generators within that balancing authority became part of the EIM and other regions didn't join. So you can see that there's this variation. These blank spots are just different um, utilities or balancing authorities that didn't join the EIM. So we have this variation in participation but because these balancing authorities opted into EIM, there um, is a possibility that my results could be biased because um, they decided to join. And if they are in some way different because they, they decided to join, that could bias the results. And so to address this, I actually match on the selection mechanism. So things that balancing authorities said were the reason that they joined the EIM. So having excess generator capacity, having excess transmission capacity. Um, I also measured um, on marginal sellers to California. So I made sure that I was only matching on utilities that were already selling to California. So a variety of variables that the, the balancing authority said were the reason they joined the EIM. I actually included those in my matching me mechanism. I pre-processed the data with that um, to help address that, that, that potential bias in the results. So these are my regressions um, 
The first is my difference and differences model, and the second is my triple differences model. And basically what I do is I take total NOx or SO2 emissions in the jth generator in the ith balancing authority at time t. So this is hourly data. Um, and then EIM entrance was at the balancing authority level. So if the balancing authority joins the EIM, this indicator turns to one, basically. So what I'm interested in here is this level shift in NOx emissions for gas gener generators or NOx or SO2 emissions for coal generators if the generator is in a balancing authority that joins the EIM. And then I include a variety of fixed effects. So I have hourly fixed effects to account for correlation in demand and NOx emissions throughout the course of the day. I include day of week fixed effects to account for differences in demand by weekday or weekend. I include month by year fixed effects to ac account for regional, um, I mean, sorry, to account for um, long-term trends. And then I also have balancing authority level fixed effects to account for regional differences in infrastructure or, or climate, that sort of thing. And then I cluster the errors at the balancing authority level. And then in my triple difference uh, model, I also include the interaction with residual load to see how that generator on the margin is responding differently to, to um, the incremental increases in, in residual load. And interactions are mean centered, so I can, in, I can interpret these coefficients as at the mean of residual load. And then I include um, the various pairwise interactions and residual load in those regressions. So these are my results. You can see, I'm gonna focus on this column here, the matched column from the triple differences model. On average, I find that the average gas generator reduces its NOx emissions by six pounds. On the margin, I didn't see any um, significant difference in how generators were responding to incremental increases in residual load, but um, I did find that this varied throughout the course of the day. So sometimes in the day we're were significant um, and I wanted to show you my temporal regression. So I was looking at this result by hour of day as well. And you can see that when these generators are reducing their NOx emissions are actually during the daylight hours. So this is when um, solar power is online, but it's also when residual load is high. So a couple things could be driving this result that I've thought about. So. One was, you know, the question, is the EIM just favoring relatively cleaner generators? And the answer to that, I think from my identification strategy is no, because I matched on generators um, before joining the EIM. And I also, so these are as close as possible before joining the EIM. And then I also include various controls like NOx, um, NOx emissions controls, generator age, uh, a measure of the, the, the heat input, for example, to control for um, differences in generators. So I think that the identification strategy accounts for, for um, the fact that they could be selling to, they're just favoring cleaner generators. And I think that, no, I can rule that out. And then another thing would be if the EIM is just buying electricity or, using electricity from generators that are um, already in the EIM. So if they're only taking electricity from EIM generators. And I also account for that with my matching strategy. So I match on marginal sellers to California before generators join the EIM. So I have those generators that are already marginal, um, marginal sellers to California. But another thing could be um, if these generators are just being operated more efficiently by the EIM. And um, I think that is the case. I've been working on some new regressions to address the mechanism. And um, I am seeing some improvements in um, heat rate, essentially, um, so, so that these are op being operated more efficiently. But I, I'm still working out the mechanism and working on those results. But that's kind of, um, I think, where this, where this is going. But I did want to mention that Another thing to consider is that as this residual load varies throughout the day, so we have, I have plotted the load here, the demand here, and then I have residual load, which is demand less the renewable resource production. As this um, 
residual load changes throughout the day, we could see a different portfolio of generators responding to, to, this, to these changes in, in residual load. And that can affect which, um, which generators are responding and where these generators are located. So I also wanted to look at these results by region to see, um, especially for local pollution outcomes, where these changes in NOx or SO2 emissions are indeed occurring. And so in my regional regressions, which I have shown here. What I found for gas generators is that these significant reductions in NOx emissions are actually occurring in the Pacific Core Balancing Authority, which is a more remote balancing authority. It's further away from California. Whereas in Arizona, um, public, ser public Service Company or Nevada Power or Puget Sound Energy, I see marginal to neglig like negligible um, increases in NOx emissions. So I'm seeing a difference in geographic um, ge ge geographic regions by which generators are responding. And then for coal generators, even though on average, I don't see any um, significant increase or decrease in NOx or SO2 emissions. When I look at the region, I do see some pretty significant increases. So in Arizona Public Service Company or Nevada Power, I see significant increases in NOx emissions, whereas in Pacific Core, I see significant reductions in NOx emissions. And these same patterns are um, observed for SO2 emissions as well. So um, I'm still trying to nail down this, this mechanism and what's going on in these regional regressions. But um, it's, I mean, the, there's a potential, I think, that if the EIM is using more generation, I'm gonna speak in generation, even though this is on um, NOx emissions, if they're using more generation from, from gas generators to meet demand, then um, there's the poten potential that these regions um, then backfill their own demand with coal generation. So that's one possibility. Or it could be that coal generators are now um, following the shape of demand a little bit more, um, not just base load anymore. So these are some things I'm still working on um, but that's kind of the direction that the research is going. So in summary, the EIM is leading to average reductions in NOx emissions for gas generators, but there's significant heterogeneity in the distribution of these local pollution outcomes across different geographic regions and generators. I find that coal generators NOx emissions are increasing by 50% and SO2 emissions are increasing by 31% in regions close to California, whereas more remote regions are seeing decreases in NOx and SO2 emissions. And these local pollutants lead to millions of dollars of damages in some of these regions that are closer to California. So I think that's all I have. I'm looking forward to any questions anyone has. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. <clears throat> so uh, there is time for questions, comments. Is there someone? Interested to have some more precisions from the part of Brittany? Yes, Tatiana? Um, yes. Uh, I want to know uh, is there any transmission restrictions to make this mechanism and why it is not used now? It's very good mechanism, as I see. Sure. So I do have in the paper, I, that's one thing I didn't talk about. So I have looked at transmission congestion and how that affects results. Um, so it's hard um, in the US. I can't really get, or at least I don't know where to get um, uh, information on transmission lines. I think that's considered like national security, a national security issue or something like that. But I do have um, information on transmission congestion, in particular on export and import lines for the California ISO. So I've looked at these results when there is congestion on import and export lines and when there's not congestion on those lines. And I find that when there's not congestion, the results pretty much look like my pooled generator results that I found. But when there is um, congestion on export lines from the California ISO, then I see some really significant reductions in, um, in NOx emissions. 
So I think that to some extent that transmission capacity is an important factor for, um, for these results. So when California can't send out that solar power, um, I see that the, at least the NOx emissions in gas generators go down pretty significantly, which I think maybe they're being turned down, but I still need to nail that down a little bit more. So I am considering it, but I think it's still, um, I'm still trying to work out the details of it, but I do think it's an important piece of the puzzle. And I think that was a good question. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Someone else? Yes. So my, yes. Um, so, um, it's just one one question about this uh, EIM that you presented. Um, I'm just wondering, is it like does it work like a uniform pricing? Um, because I know in the US you have like different models. I think Texas, for example, has something. Uh, yes, some kind of an order pricing approach. I think, and other states do not have this. And how does this uh, EIM work? Is it like an expanding price zone? Um, I'm asking this because this would actually be exactly the opposite of uh, the European developments, basically. Because in Europe, we, we try to like reduce the price zones um, and th this would be the opposite, right? Yeah, so this is a really good question. And I know that California has nodal pricing for sure, but um, it's a really good question. You know, across the EIM, I'd have to go and look at ca the California ISO system to see if they have pricing nodes for the area of the EIM outside of California or if they just use like the the node where the import occurs so I don't have the answer to your question right now but I will look into that um but California definitely has nodal pricing yeah I mean it could be possible because you said they have a very um sophisticated um uh, clearing mechanism I would say so, right so this this yeah, could yeah. be possible yeah okay thank yeah, you I'll have to look into that thank you Other questions? So no more questions, Brittany? Um, so I think that uh, we can uh, sum up here all these four presentations. Uh, various presentation from issues in electricity markets. Thank you all for attending uh, this concurrent session. I wish you, uh, I wish to the four speakers uh, nice opportunities for their research papers in the following. Um, so, um, what else? I wish you a nice evening for those who the evening uh, is starting on a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Maria? It was okay, Maria? Uh, Sorry, it was okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was Thank perfect. you. Thank you.